We're back, and we're here with Michael Scott, whose latest book, Magician, The Secrets of the Immortal Nicholas Flamel from Delacorte Press, is in bookstores now. Welcome to Fast Forward, and thank, thank you. you for taking the time. Delighted to do I it. I was looking at your schedule for the last two days, and you have been just about everywhere in the great Washington, D.C. area. I, I just don't look at my schedule. You know, I just, <laughs> just get in the car and go there. It'll frighten me if I look at it too much. Now, this is the second book in what is going to be a six-novel yeah. series. And we're following the adventures of two young teenage, American teenagers, uh, Sophie and Josh Newman, yeah. who have a destiny. They do have a destiny, uh, which isn't quite revealed yet. Um, the story started in, in The Alchemist with Sophie and Josh, who are two 15 and a half year old American teenagers, ordinary boys and girls. And I wanted to write a story about ordinary folk. I wanted to s write a story which is set in the here and now, which is why this is a contemporary series, which opens in San Francisco. We're dealing with a boy and a girl who have iPods and cell phones and go online and, and do all the things that real teens do. And then one day, everything changes. And really, it's a story of how they change and how they deal with change. Sophie's working in, a book in the coffee shop. Josh is working in the bookshop. And the bookshop owner happens to be the immortal Nicholas Flamel. Who had, who, of course, the historical Nicholas Flamel was a bookseller in Europe. It was one of the, it was the way he made his, it was one of the ways one he of made his fortune. I was a bookseller for 25 years, and I, I had always promised myself one day I would make a bookseller a hero because we used to get a terribly bad press. And once I discovered that Flamel was a, a bookseller, I mean, that really solidified the story for me. Nicholas Flamel, like everyone else in this series, is based in either history or mythology. Nicholas Flamel was, in his day, one of the most famous men in Europe. He was a bookseller, and everything I'm about to tell you now is true. One day he buys a book which he cannot translate. He spends 20 years traveling across Europe with his wife, Perenelle, and then he returns to Paris, extraordinarily wealthy. I mean, Bill Gates wealthy. He founds churches and hospitals and schools, some of which still exist in Paris today. There's a street named after him in Paris, the Rue Flamel, and around the corner there's the Rue Perenelle. And then when he dies, there's no money. Suddenly there's no money. So his grave is dug up, and the grave is found to be empty. And then Perenelle's grave is dug up, and it too is found to be empty. The house is ransacked, and there's nothing in the house. Two years later, Flamel and Perenelle are spotted in Rome. And two years after that, they're spotted in Berlin. And the story is, of course, that they had discovered the two greatest secrets of alchemy, how to turn base metal into gold and how to become immortal. And from there, we go into what I think is, on your part, one of the most ambitious uh, elements of this storyline. You are taking mythology and legends from every culture I can possibly imagine and are bringing them to life as characters that we run across in this story. I mean, just in the first two books, the number of different mythologies that you touch upon is absolutely staggering. I swear, when I'm reading it, I think I should be sitting next to a computer with Google up just so I can start typing things in and make sure I understand exactly who I'm listening to on the page. You should be able to read it just as a straightforward fantasy. And, and you can, but, but I'm just curious because I love myth. I, I came into science fiction and fantasy f through mythology. Same as myself. And, 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 and for you, of course, you're drawing on years and years of research and work. I mean, your first, some of your first books were the Tales of the Dodanus. That's right. Yeah. Which were a remarkable collection of, of Irish mythology, much of which was still only contained in oral history. I started, my first book was published in 1982, and I was a bookseller at that time. And I became aware as a bookseller that there wasn't really or hadn't really been a collection of Irish folklore, a new collection for a very long time. The great collections, the, the, the Joseph Jacobs collections, the Lady Gregory collections, were in print, but they were in print from the last century. There hadn't been a new collection. At that stage, I was lucky enough to be traveling around the country buying books, which is my job. And I was coming across these extraordinary stories, many of which still existed only in the oral Irish tradition. Mm -hmm. They had never been written down. Because in Ireland, the culture of the Shanachie, which is the traveling storyteller, still existed. And I began to collect those stories. I began to put them together into what ultimately became three volumes, three volumes for adults, and then separately three volumes for, 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 for children. And you know, those books are still in print today, 25 years later, which is extraordinary. You know, some of them are not terribly well written, I would be the first to admit, but I was young. You know. Well, but, but the, the layer of myth, I mean, what I like about it is the idea that, and it's carried through in the books, is that myth 
is merely a story told to explain what was a reality yes. for a people and a culture. It allowed them to understand what was happening around them and to have an explanation that they could pass down about why certain things happened or about why certain events occurred or to, in a way that, that could be remembered easily, events that had occurred uh, within the culture's timeline. They help us make sense, or they helped our ancestors make sense of the world, which was in many ways incomprehensible to them. It's interesting, you know, you read the series and you can read it as pure fantasy. If you know the background to some of the characters, it will la land another, another layer to the, to the story. But myths change all the time and they grow all, all the time. What's fascinating to me about myths is how quickly they grow up. I mean, we all know the story of the cargo cults and in, in the, in the Pacific Islands, this is a cult which grew up because the natives saw airplanes flying over. And within three years, I mean, it's within 36 months that people were worshipping the gods in, 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 in the airplanes. They were mo making wooden models of airplanes. That's within three years. Mythology is constantly changing, constantly moving. But at its heart, there is a reality. Was there really a King Arthur? Probably. You know, was there really a Robin Hood? Probably. You know, were they real men? Was there really a Gil Gilgamesh? Absolutely, we have enough evidence to suggest that there was a Gilgamesh. And what happens is they are changed and altered by time and by story, and we're constantly making myths. Nowadays, we make our sporting heroes into heroes. You know, heroes is the traditional myth word. And you use that, that desire of mankind to create story, to explain, to understand, as a way of explaining why some of the extraordinary events that occur in this book. I feel very, you know, this isn't a country that has a close love affair with the French. But I felt very sorry for Paris by the end of this book. And I'm very afraid for London, which is where, as I, which apparently is where the is, next book is, the going next to take, is, is going to take care of. You are laying waste to Western Europe in this I'm story. Having a lot, this, I'm having a lot of fun with, with this series, I have to say. I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, yes, I have fun with Paris. It's one of my favorite cities. What we don't, what a lot of people don't know, of course, is that beneath Paris are the catacombs, this extraordinary collection of, of tunnels filled with bones. Again, a gift to any writer. And of course, I had to use them. I think London will fare slightly better. It doesn't come off quite as badly as Paris does. One of the things I wanted to do with this series was, first of all, to set it in America. Because talking about myths, people say to me, America has no mythology. I would maintain that America has the best mythology in the world. Because not only do you have your native mythologies, what happens, of course, when all the immigrants were coming in, they brought with them their music and their songs and their language and their stories. So America has this extraordinary melting pot of stories, which is one of the reasons this series is set into almost entirely in America. And why you seem to have brought the stories and the myths of all the immigrants from all the countries together as elements, at least so far, in the story that you're telling. I'm working on the premise that m much of the world mythology is actually linked, or it is the one story. The example that I will give you is that in, in Celtic lore, there's the story of the children of Lear, L-I-R, which is a story of four children changed into swans. That story is universal to just about every country in the world. The only change is that different animals. In China, they're changed into dragons. In Inuit folklore, they're changed into polar bears. In some of the American native mythologies, they're changed into jaguars or they're changed into grizzly bears. In Europe, they're changed into wolves. But it is the same story. So we're back to a, a core truth or a core story. And that's what I'm doing with this series, pulling all the world's mythology and having a lot of fun with it. And, 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 and in the structure of the, of the antagonists and the protagonists in this, you have several different categories of immortal. Mm. Immortal means different things depending on the circumstances. You have uh, the elder, the elders, yeah. which are the old races. These would be the old, what we would now consider to be the old gods, the traditional mythological gods, yes. And then you have one category of immortals who acquire their immortality yes. through allegiance to these old gods. Yeah. We'll call them that for short. Well, this is again to do with the, with the cost and the price of immortality. One of the things I wanted to explore with this is what would it be like to be immortal? We look at Nicholas Flamel in this series who's 500 and odd years old. What's it like to be that old? Dr. John Dee who appears in this, what's it like to be that old? You know, again, 500 years to watch everyone you know die. Niccolò Machiavelli appears in, in the next book only because he's such an amazing character. There is a very poignant scene, which exclusive revelation for you, but, I, but only because I've just written it this morning. Oh, <laughs> oh my. Before I came in. 
ex where Niccolò Machiavelli ponders on the death of his wife, you know, to have it to stand there and watch his wife die. This is the cost of immortality. In one of your characters, the young warrior mate, the warrior, Scapa. talk talks about that. Yes, talks about how she she's so alone, partially because she can't stand to gain these friendships and these links with people and then while she remains eternal, watch them fade away. It's just too painful. Because I think what part of what makes us human are our network of friends and our family. They are what, usually what keeps us grounded and often our identity is through our friends or how they know us. What, what is it like to have nobody know you, to be uh, effectively invisible? And that's one of the themes which is explored. It's also the big theme in, in the book is of trust. We have Sophie and Josh, 15 and a half, they're twins, growing up together, same school, same background, same everything. And then Sophie gets powers that Josh doesn't. And suddenly, the boy who's devoted to his sister doesn't know her and indeed doesn't trust her. And indeed, one of the big themes throughout the series is who do we trust? And, and each of the protagonists, major protagonists that we met, whether it's uh, Nicholas and Perronel, whether it's uh, uh, the Count de Saint-Germain and Joan of Arc, who have become a couple. It's like they seek someone who can know and understand them because they need that one anchor in order to remain oriented in the world. With Nicholas and Perronel, they were together before they discovered the secret of immortality. With the Count de Saint-Germain, he found they had met, he had met Joan in se several different settings and then they found each other and they realized what they could be for each other because they both had the same experience of watching the world go by. You know, that, that's very interesting and, and, and I have to say to you, you're the first one to pick up on that. At the core of the story is the theme of love. Nicholas and Parnell are devoted to each other. Joan and Saint-Germain also devoted to, 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 to each other. And it's one of the reasons that on the very first cover we put a broken heart mm -hmm. all, because all the symbols on the cover relate to the story. Mm -hmm. And it is to do with the theme of love. And Josh and Sosie have each other. Yes. More, more so than even than the others. They know each other in every way possible you can without being the same person. And again, they are, they've been taken out of their comfortable environment. So we've now separated them from the real world and they're now in this extraordinary world. All they have to depend on are themselves. And even now that's changing. As you tell this story, how much of what you draw on in terms of the mythological background that you're using and the characters that you're drawing on is from the work that you've done previously, the work that you're very, very familiar with? How much of it requires you to go looking for information in order to be able to feel comfortable telling the story of the character? You know, this is not a series I could have written 10 years ago, to be honest. I mean, I first started writing this in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. That's when I first started pulling together all the notes. This is a six book series. I have pl plotted them out to the nth degree because the first book takes place over two days. The second book takes place over two days. The entire series takes place over a month. I had to have all my research in place. It's been a great excuse for me to go and visit them, some of the most extraordinary places in the world, which is part of the joy of, 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 of writing. I have all of the research in place because one of the dangers in writing something like this is you would start to write, suddenly realize you need a new character or, 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 or a new creature, and then be seduced by the research, which I always am. Mm. <laughs> so I put all the elements in place first, then I started to write. Now, Nicholas, you talk about this being one month, and we should, we should explain that that's because there is a countdown going on for Nicholas and Perronel. They have discovered the secret of immortality and have not bound themselves to an elder because of the codex, the I won't call it the MacGuffin, it shouldn't be called that, but the Codex is basically the core of this entire, because with the Codex complete, you can bring the elders back. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, Dr. John Dee is attempting. And they are trying to, and, and the Sophie and Josh are the twins, mentioned in the Codex as saviors or destroyers? Maybe. Maybe. One or t'other, yes. One or t'other. And they aren't the first pair of twins to appear in the world. That's one of the big revelations. Yes. In this book is the, is the fact that there have been other twins. As yeah. a matter of fact, there were other twins that at very, very, at, at a very remarkable turning point in the history of this world, when an island that had been drawn up from the sea was sunken once again, and the power of the elders was broken. Yeah. Again, the twins appear throughout mythology. Every race, every country has a, at its core the story of, of, of twins. The codex that's mentioned in this book is the book that Nick, the real Nicholas Flamel bought back in France in the Middle Ages. That is the book. And it actually existed. We have his own notebook. We have his own diaries, his own descriptions of the book. Mm -hmm. The original book is lost, but we have the illustrations from the book. 
I mean, the huge stick I created to beat myself with in this series <laughs> is by insisting that every single character is real. If I say to you, they go down this street, they turn left and right, you can go on to Google Earth or something like that and follow and, and, and track them. And children have really reacted to this it's in an extraordinary way. So in a couple of years, we're going to have Flamel tours of Paris. I, I will say to you that I've just had a friend back from Paris and Nicolas Flamel's house still exists in Paris, mm -hmm. 51 Rue de Montmorency, it, you will find the Auberge Nicolas Flamel. And they, they had to go and see it, obviously. And they found a copy of the, both the alchemist and the magician in the window. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I must go and get a free, a free meal because it is a very <laughs> fine restaurant. So now, yes, it's starting. So you've got them all plotted out. All now, the first two are out. Yep. And we know that the next one, which is called The Sorceress. The Sorceress will be coming next year. May 26 next year. May 26 next year. So precise. It's kind of comforting in a way. It, it, well, it also means that I have to deliver on time, you know, <laughs> because you, you, the, the, the date is booked, you know. Now, the first, two, the first book took two day, covers two days. The second book covers two days. Well, that means you have at least 26 days book left. Bookets of time, yes. Oh, yes. Of time. Well, I'm not going to use up my full month. Because what's happening is Nicholas and Paranel are aging throughout the series. They are immor they're immortal, and this is a spell they must renew. But the spell changes because the codex is constantly changing. So they cannot memorize the spell. They must have the pages. So if they don't get, get it back, they're dust. And there goes, there, there go the secrets of the immortal there go the secrets. Well, Michael, I want to thank you. We're just about out of time. We've just got a few seconds left. I really do appreciate it. I enjoy the book. It's just such an adventure, and oh, there's so many so things. Much. I want to go back. I want to reread it. I want to look at look at the characters more carefully, and expand my world a little bit through them, as I uh, as I do the research that you've already done to I'll find out I'll, more about them. I'll give you my notes. <laughs> I thank you so much. Thank you. But again, thank you so much. Delighted. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest. We hope you come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Shad saying, take care. <laughs>